this is the plague of the millennials. Um, and by the way, I love I, most of the people I work with are millennials, and I love them, and I would rather work with millennials than anybody else. They are um, they are empowered. Um, they work hard. They want to change the world, but they also want immediate gratification, fulfillment, um, satisfaction, recognition, and um, to be promoted um, within the first six months. You are you have a job now. This is what it is. And I, I realize you might have had a job when you were in college. You, might, you have a career now. And it's not all sunshine and rainbows. And the first, I would like to kind of like just get on my soapbox for a second. Um, the first five years of your career, don't expect anyone to say you're doing a good job. We are here because we know the outcomes in our lives are within our control. That taking absolute ownership of how we eat, sleep, train, think, and connect with each other is how we'll optimize our health and happiness. That chasing excellence is how we grab hold of what is possible. Our mission is to live on the run, always chasing, never stop. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Chasing Excellence. How are you, Ben? You're still down the Cape, I can see. I am. Down the Cape, uh, in a gym between training sessions with Katrin. So, nice. how's how is training going? Um, things are really yeah. So things are, things are really good. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Training's going really well. Love Cape Cod. Yep. So this is a it's a magical, beautiful place. So yeah. love and life. A little different than than last year when you were down there, though, huh? Little little different uh, life wise, anyways. Well, uh, ev- everything's different. Yeah. <laughs> life wise, everywhere, not everywhere, not just the Cape. Yes. To where we are. Yeah, that is yeah. true. Um, how's training going? How's anticipation for a games that may happen at some point, somewhere at some level? How, how, how is the uncertainty yeah. around all that going? Uh, it's good. I mean, this is what this, our athletes are probably more prepared for this than, you know, when I say our, I mean like CrossFit athletes yep. are probably more prepared this than, than any other sport. Um, because we're ready to kind of roll with the punches and deal with the unknowns. So, um, you know, I think that everyone was actually kind of grateful for the, for the delay and the pushback yeah. of six weeks or so, um, quarantine put kind of a, a halt on a lot of people's training for various different reasons. And this is just another opportunity to, um, you know, I think people are seeing this more as a blessing than a, like, a, ah, gosh, darn it. I wish I could just get this thing over with. Yeah. Yeah, cool. All right, this week, uh, last week we did a three by three, and it made me miss doing two minute drills. So we're gonna mm-hmm. do a two minute drill this time. Um, so two minute drills cool. are when I uh, go through uh, emails and Instagram DMs from listeners who have questions for you, questions they want to hear us discuss, uh, and our completely artificial and sometimes ignored constraint is that you're supposed to answer them within two minutes. Um, and these questions are, uh, we were joking beforehand, the questions that we've got lined up today, a lot of them do not warrant a two or, or, or warrant a longer than two minute answer, but we're going to, we're going to keep you to two minutes regardless. I'm going to challenge my, I'm going to try to uphold the challenge. Awesome. All right. First question. I have like a watch, stop watch going in front of me. Yeah. First one is, is maybe the, 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 the hardest of the whole bunch, but we'll see how you do. Question is, I grew up in an extremely conservative religious household, and since going to college, I've become very liberal and much less religious. However, my family doesn't know anything about my own personal beliefs to the point where it feels like I'm living two separate lives. I love my family more than anything, but it's getting difficult both mentally and emotionally to be living a lie, and he's got that in quotes, every time I'm around them. How can I live in harmony with people who have drastically different worldviews and values that I do? Okay. That's a, that's a heavy one. That's a doozy. Um, yeah, that's a doozy. So under two minutes, I'm already using up 10 seconds right now. <laughs> um, I, so to me, it would start with, this is the reason that we kind of harp and rely on values, principles, moral compass, and the like, because they help you decide ahead of time the way you're going to um, act in these in, the, in these times of crisis, in these in these yeah. um, crossroads, so uh, a couple of the key words there in that was he said um, they don't line up with my values. That's a big one. But he also said in there, I believe something along the lines like family means the most to me of yeah. anything in my life. Yep. Okay, so to me, that's the question: mm. is what 
is more important. And this is why you need to create a hierarchy to your values. I'm saying, I'm not saying one, two, three, four. I'm saying one and then everything else. Mm-hmm. There has to be the one. There has to be the essential intent. There has to be the priority. Only recently, when I say recently, in the last 100 and 150 years, have we changed the word priority to be priorities and make it plural. The problem here is he's saying, I love my family above all. It's the most important thing to me, but they're not in line with my values. So what I'm kind of getting at here is if one of your values is truth above all else, mm-hmm. then that can very quickly decide, like you tell them where you are and you hope that your family is as supportive and loves you no matter who, what you now believe you are. But if one of your values is, as you send in there, harmony, then you, it's like, you like suck it up buttercup and just kind of like, I know it's hard to live this dichotomy and, but like, if you want true harmony in your life, then that's the road you go down. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's, it depends on the way you are ranking the system. I could tell you what I would do, not saying what you should do. This would be me. Um, my first value is family above all uh, is family first. Mm-hmm. So I would, um, rely on that, but very close to tied to that is it's all about truth, um, um, embracing harsh realities, um, and truth above all else, um, honesty. So because honesty is one of mine, and all the others, I would have the hard conversation. Um, I would do it tactfully and let them know it's hard, but that's what I would do. It's kind of the similar situation where people are growing up and holding in a lie that, um, they're gay. Mm-hmm. And they're like, my parents are going to, um, you know, they're so conservative. They're not going to, um, accept me for who I actually am. And they live this, um, this false life for so long only to then have the hard conversation and the parents go, I know, yeah, I knew all along. Like, yeah. so I, I would, I would not be shy away from the hard conversations because they're hard. Um, but the thing I do before that is truly um, weigh and measure your values. Yeah, yeah, that's a tough one. How was that? The, Two minutes? The, uh, no, that was a three and a half. That more? was all right. Yeah, I'll give it to you. Um, <laughs> next question. That's a, hard, that's a long one for two yeah, minutes. That's a tough one. Yeah. All right. Next one is living in the present or embracing the moment is a concept that I struggle with. I pride myself on always looking ahead to the next step, planning, handling logistics, etc., and never settling or never si- uh, sitting still to ensure that I get the best out of myself. But I'm also conscious that I never tend to embrace the moments I work toward as I'm always looking to the next thing. How do you balance embracing the moment while continuing to plan next steps to move the needle forward again? These are not two minute questions. Okay. (laughs) Okay. So challenging. Um, So here's um, what I want this person to realize is that preparing for the future um, is the right thing to be doing. It is focusing on your circle of control mm. and it is, um, you, you can still be in the moment while you do that. Being present doesn't mean that you're not preparing for the future. That's, that's not what that is at all. Being present means that while you are doing that planning, you are in that moment. You are not multitasking. You're not checking your mm. phone. You're not doing it while also preparing for a meeting. You're not doing it while also rehashing the failures of the past. You're also not doing it while um, getting distracted by the fears of the future. We want you to be preparing. We say, actually, of all the things that you can't control and all the things inside that circle, it boils down to just two things. One of those is your preparation. Mm. You have ultimate control of your preparation. The other is the efforts you are giving in the moment. So if you are buckling down, preparing your ass off for an um, unknowable or known or foreseeable events coming down the pipeline, you're killing it. You're doing exactly that. Stop being so hard on yourself. Now, the other thing I would lead into there is they they said, um, I'm having a hard time being still. Mm. That's what I would actually challenge is create the time for, as Ryan Holiday would call it, the stillness. Yep. Create the solitude. Create the time to have introspection. It sounds actually like this person's doing a pretty good job. If they're aware of this to that point where they're saying, I'm having a hard time being still, that's introspection right there. Mm-hmm. So um, they're kind of already in like um, 
I don't want to say advanced class, but they are not in the base level classes right now. They're they're um, this person's operating at a pretty pretty good level just yeah. with that level of awareness. Yeah, the, the only- but just stop being so hard on yourself. Yeah, about like getting down on preparing for the future. Right. Now, what we're saying is, if you're saying like you're at the beach with your family, but you're having a hard time being at the beach with your family because your mind is escaping to the meeting you have on Monday. That's not what we want to do. That's not being present. Mm-hmm. But if it's time to prepare and you're kicking ass, then you're kicking ass. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's also sometimes a confusion or it's easy to get lost in the idea of um, mindfulness, which is a practice in and of itself. And I think what this individual does, which is like spend time thinking about the future. And I think it could be easy to think that we're always supposed to be. I don't know, focusing on our breath or, or paying attention to what's like that, that is actually different. And both of them are valuable to your point, but both of but they're different. Uh, they're different practices or they're different things to, they're different states of mind. So to your point, I'm going to, um, I don't know if it's expound upon that or counter it, mm. but mindfulness practice is practice. So you can bring it into all the other aspects of your life. Yep. You are practicing this controlled environment so that when you get into a state of anxiety, when you get into the pressure moment, when you feel the fight or flight coming on, that you know how to get yourself back yep. to that parasympathetic nervous system. You know how to get yourself out of fight or flight. You know how to get yourself back to the present moment with non judgment. So, as long as this person, it sounds like they're doing the preparing, they're doing the effort, what they need to do is get themselves out of, um, Out of that kind of like spinning on the anxiety aspect of it, though, the anxiousness aspect of it, and just live in that moment. Yes, you're preparing for the future, but enjoy the moment you're doing it right now for what it is. That's okay. Don't hear prepare for the future as I'm not being present. Right. Right. Next question. Why can't I just eat according to my plan instead of grabbing an extra cookie? Why do we (laughs) self-sabotage? Because of uh, feelings and emotions. Ah, those are the worst. And yes, they're the, <laughs> those are the worst. Oh, man. <laughs> ben Bergeron trying to teach us all to be robots again. <laughs> okay. So, but it really, it is because of feelings and emotions. And you're projecting the feelings and the emotions that Cookie is going to give you and choosing those short term, which are almost guaranteed over the long-term not guaranteed. Hmm. So what I mean by that is if you say there's the cookies there and you know that if you have the cookies, it's going to taste good. Like everybody kind of understands that. You're betting on that as opposed to the much harder bet, which is I'm going to say no to the cookies. And because of that, I'm going to be healthier, leaner, stronger, and more vibrant a month from now, mm. six months from now, 10 years from now. It's um, taking the, the, the sure, immediate thing, that gratification over the unsure, much, much, much harder long-term. Mm-hmm. And that's the reason why, I mean, if you want to know the reason, they ask the reason why. That's why. Now there's tactics all over the place that we could use to flip the script and work with it and willpower and environments and all these other things. But the question of why do we self-sabotage, it's because of that. Mm. It's because you want the cookie and you're you're more concerned with the immediate gratification of the cookie than you are of doing the hard work. You hear this all the time about people like, um, I want to be um, a famous musician. I want to be CEO of a company. I want to go to the CrossFit Games. But they're not willing to do the work that it takes to get there. Mm-hmm. Everybody wants the abs. Everybody wants the health. Everyone wants what comes with avoiding the cookie, but it's, it's hard. You got to say no in the moment to the short term gratification and it's hard. Yeah. Next question is percussion recovery, a valid form of recovery or is it simply a fad? And I'm just going to add, maybe it might be useful to explain what, uh, what percussion recovery even is. So I'm, I, I believe that they're talking about like uh, like the vibration, like uh, Theraguns, um, um, 
hypervolts, mm. the handheld, yep. um, like vibrating um, things that people use for kind of self massage. Yep. Um, it is a valid, it is not a fad, it is valid. Um, having said that, it's not the type of thing that this is my understanding and my experience with it. It is a valid tool more so to use to eliminate um, pain and soreness mm. than it is to improve mobility. Okay. So it is a more of a valid tool in terms of recovery sense than it is in terms of the um, length of tissue that you might get from other other things. Got it. Next question. What are your thoughts on- I finally answered one under yeah. two minutes. Ex excellent job. We should quit now. Um, yes. What are your thoughts on using physical exercises like burpees or shuttle, shuttle sprints as a disciplinary tool for kids, in my case, six and eight years old, could this potentially cause them to avoid physical activities in the future? Yeah, I have six and eight-year-olds as well. Um, Did you send so this question in? Great question. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and, and one that I honestly don't have the answer to because I think it dot, dot, dot depends. Yeah. So if you do it in the form that it looks like punishment, um, they are going to associate that with bad yeah. and they're not going to want to do it. Like go to your room, you lost technology rights. Um, you need to do 30 burpees. Like that is now a punishment and something that they don't want to do. I will say that I have chosen my kids not to do that because of that. Now the flip side of that is if these kids are bad enough and they do them enough, people, uh, don't, um, find their passion, they create it. Mm. So you could actually do this so much that they get really good mm -hmm. and they get fit. <laughs> and then they're like, holy crap, like this hard training is paying off now when they are 15, 16, 17 years old, because they are the fittest kids on their teams and in their schools. And it might be okay that they don't like it. Muhammad Ali said, you know, I hated every minute of training in the gym. But I worked as hard as I could so I could be a, live as a champion forever. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing. They might hate it, but they're like, holy crap, this, I'm, I, I see what this, what this happens with this. And it kind of goes back to the last question, right? Then they become willing to do the hard stuff for the long-term gains. Yep. So it's, it's a conundrum. It's a, it's a both. And I, I don't think there's a right or a wrong to it. Mm -hmm. My mom, when uh, we, are, we were being bad, um, when we lived in the city, there was this huge flight of stairs outside. Um, and whenever we were being bad, my mom used to just point to the three boys and be like, outside, run the stairs. Mm -hmm. and we have to go do 10 flights, 10 lengths of the stairs. Each, uh, flight was about three or four stories. So we had to do 10 of those before we came back. Yeah. Wow. How old were you then? High school. high school. Uh, soft, uh, I was a sophomore in high school. Yeah. Do you think a lot of this question comes down to just the age at, and at what age does it, is there, is it yeah, possible I, that you're adding that it could be a positive and which, at which age that it's probably a negative? I don't know if it's the age as much as it is context. Hmm. Um, if you are like, you are so bad, I'm going to make you hate this. Um, and when they come back in, you say, wasn't that so terrible? Hmm. If you ever do that, I'm gonna make you do it like that type of thing. Talk about like reinforcing yeah. a negative uh, association. Yep. Um, as opposed to like, like the way my mom did it was she kind of made it fun. Yep. She, you know, like it was almost like a joke, like get outside, run the stairs. Yeah. We come back in. It was like, what was your time? How'd you yep. do? Like, you know, kind of like fun. Got it. So this is all your mom's fault then. Every, everything about you now. I'm understanding it. She started. Cool. It. Next question. I love mornings and getting up. <laughs> What's that? I just said, yes. <laughs> Um, I love mornings and getting up early, but how do you fit in all your morning essentials without most of the day disappearing? If I try to meditate, journal, work out first thing, I find that once I add in some other essentials like showering, breakfast, et cetera, I feel like half the morning is gone and I'm chasing my tail for the rest of the day. What are your tips on an efficient, enjoyable, and non-stressful morning routine? Yeah, I, agree. I love it. Great question. Um, I would say that you're nailing it. Um, I, would, I think that half of your morning should be your essentials. Mm. This person just said it that exactly. Yep. There's the um, essential and urgent, brush teeth, go to the bathroom, get some food, 
um, take a shower. Those are the essential and urgent. Then there's the, um, the, um, essential and not urgent, right? Which is journaling and exercising and meditating and reading. Um, I think that half of your morning should be spent on exactly this. And this, what this person is saying is half of my morning is eaten up with this. Great. I don't think that the issue is the morning routine. I think the issue is the productivity or the workload or the expectation of what you should be accomplishing in the remaining part of your day. Mm. And to that, I would say prioritize the rest of your day. You're killing the morning. The rest of the day, it sounds like maybe you're focusing on a lot more of urgent stuff and not important stuff. Mm -hmm. And I would, I would read um, – Things like David Allen's Getting Things Done. I would read um, Essentialism by Greg McCown. I would read um, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, Stephen Covey, um, and start to kind of lean into some of the principles and tactics that they use to create greater efficiency in your life. Because what this person has done is they are doing it. They're putting on all of these things that are going to have massive long-term benefits. The problem is you don't see them this week, this month, or maybe even this year. Yeah. It all comes full circle in the next three to five years is what I found. Mm -hmm. I, I have shared this before with you, but um, me spending – I did this for religiously for three years, disciplined morning routine, and I thought the exact same thing. Like this is consu – like I was playing catch-up for a lot of the rest of the day. Yeah. Um, but now I'm seeing how this has benefited. I'm so clear on values and so clear on what it is I'm chasing and so clear on the priorities of my life. But it took three hard years mm. of quotes, this person chasing my tail after the morning routine to get these in place. So I would um, challenge this person to double down on the morning routine, realizing that these are the essentials with long-term um, benefits. This is the important stuff. And then challenge um, them to bring the same level of focus and discipline to the rest of the day. Yeah. Without the, the, the baggage of what society and other people are saying you should be doing. That's what gets us all caught up. So I just re-put on um, – I went uh, about a year with an autoresponder to my email saying mm -hmm. I'm not going to be checking email. Mm -hmm. I took it off during when quarantine happened, when this crazy – because things got crazy and I realized I needed to be more um, responsive to the urgency, right? That, that was a necessity of the moment. Yeah. Um, but just literally before this, literally five minutes before we got on this call, this, um, I put it back on mm. because now life has settled down. I'm ready to kind of settle back into, um, me. Here's what, if, if you don't prioritize your life, someone else will. Yep. Yep. Um, there's some similarities there to the cookie question as well. Um, <laughs> similar philosophies. Um, I think there's a similar similarities between everything we probably talked yes, about. Yes, probably. What is the best powerlifting program that you know of, or, or that you know and would recommend to get stronger? Maybe to pair up with Comp Train. Um, I, I I'd probably suggest uh, the Conjugate Method. Hmm. Um, West Side Barbell, Louis Simmons. Um, we tried a lot, but this one because it's not linear. Linear programs is what everyone likes to jump on. So whether it's Wendler 531 or starting strength or anything else um, that has a periodized approach and every week it's like descending reps, increasing weights. The problem is with CrossFit, if you're going to pair it up with CrossFit, uh, one, one day you're coming off of a rest day. The next day you're coming off of Murph and it doesn't work. Mm. So what the conjugate method does is allows you just to – it's very – so conjugate means like um, – Undulating it means like constantly varying. The, the principles of um, Louis Simmons and the conjugate method from Westside Barbell is if you want to lift maximal weights, you need to lift maximal weights. Now, they also know the law of diminishing returns. If you continually try to lift your one rep max back squat, you're not going to make gains for more than two weeks, the third week maybe, and then you're done. And you're not going to come back for a very long time. What they do instead is, I mean, talk about like, Constantly varied um, functional movements performed at relatively high intensity. Everyone knows that's CrossFit. Now think of what uh, the conjugate method does. Constantly varied. So what they do is week one, do your back squat. Mm -hmm. Week two, work up to a one rep max back squat, but with chains. Week three, do the same thing, but to a box. Week four, it's now a front squat with um, off of pins. Week five, 
it's now to a soft box. Week six, it's a pause squat. Week seven, and so on. Every single time they do it, you're changing, changing up, constantly vary. Functional movements. I mean, all, it's squat, dead bench. It's the powerlifting movements. And then um, relatively high inten- at high intensity. They're saying if you're not lifting above 90%, you're not going to get maximal gains. In fact, they actually, once a week, work up to a true one rep max. So in terms of getting stronger, that program's phenomenal. In terms of it coupled with comp train, it's, it's, it'd be terrific. Mm. Do you recommend people do uh, something additional to comp train? I mean, maybe it depends on uh, what they're doing. Yeah, with no, it comp depends train, on what their goals are. Yeah. It depends on what their starting spot is. So if somebody wants to um, um, back squat 600 pounds, it says, yes, you need to supplement with something else. If your goal is to get to the games and you already have a 475 pound back squat, no, you should not be supplementing with a, another program. Got it. Next question. I, do, uh, I don't often get super sore, but certain movements like lunges can put me out of commission for a day or two. Any strategies for dealing with soreness and how do you generally recommend training through it or, or do you generally recommend training through it or holding off? And I think specifically he was talking about DOMS, um, delayed on, onset muscle soreness. So um, just to add a little context to it. Yeah. So there are certain muscles and there are certain movement patterns that give great more soreness than others. They nailed one of them, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, lunges are, um, you could do a lot of work and not get sore. Lunges um, create a lot of soreness. And unfortunately what people do is they then associate that soreness with gains. Um, that's not the case. Mm. Some movements just make you more sore. Um, learning and start and GHD sit-ups are another one. Like um, starting GHD sit-ups, starting lunging, you get really sore. Now, in terms of, uh, there's two other questions there. It's like, how do you mitigate the soreness? And the other one was like, do you recommend training through it? Yeah. Um, so how do you mitigate the soreness? Um, recovery mm. is um, a big, massive piece of that. But the next one is exposure. The more you do that movement, the less sore you will get. Now, that's not really a great answer be, um, because you don't want to do lunges um, all the time. It's not, if you're into a falling comp train or something like that, it's not the most um, beneficial way to go about that. So then it leads into the next part of the question, which is, um, do you just train through it or do you kind of, um, 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 become aware of it and take a recovery day? And the answer is you train through it. Mm -hmm. Um, movement in general is the best thing you can do for soreness. The worst thing you can do is just sit there and on the couch. Um, cause then the next day you wake up and you're still, uh, 75% as sore as you were the day before. If you actually move, you could bring that down to below 50% the next day, if not farther. It's just, you have to be a little more diligent with your warm up on those days, making sure you are getting back, particularly with like the mobility aspect, getting back to full ranges of motion before you go into any sort of um, loaded movement patterns. Got it. Next question. My dream is to open up a CrossFit gym someday. After I graduated college, I decided to go into police work as a way to step outside my comfort zone and get more experience dealing with people. I'm a brand new police officer and the job is not at all what I thought it would be. Uh, it does not provide me with a sense of satisfaction and I don't feel good at the end of the day, either physically or mentally. I'd like, uh, I'd like to get back into training and coaching and I'm struggling to figure out how to, how to smoothly transition from police work into the fitness business. Any suggestions? Yep. The first one you're probably not going to like what I'm going to say is, um, suck it up. Hmm. Um, this happened, this is like, this is the plague of the millennials. Um, and by the way, I love, I, most of the people I work with are millennials and I love them and I would rather work with millennials than anybody else. They are, um, they are empowered. Um, they work hard. They want to change the world. But they also want immediate gratification, fulfillment, um, satisfaction, recognition, and um, to be promoted um, within the first six months. You are you have a job now. This is what it is. And I, I realize you might have had a job when you were in college. You might you have a career now, and it's not all sunshine and rainbows. And the first, I would like to kind of like just get on my soapbox for a second. Um, the first five years of your career, don't expect anyone to say you're doing a good job. Mm. You just need to buckle down and work hard. Now, that's the soapbox and that's the thing about millennials and the generation, all, all that. The flip side of that is 
Um, I am a bull. So this is like the exact opposite <laughs> side of that. I just want to like get that off. Like it's got to be there and got to recognize because what I don't want this person to do is what's going to happen is they're going to start a gym and go, this isn't what I thought it was. Yeah. This is a lot harder. This isn't the same. I don't get the same satisfaction and joy that I, and they're going to flip flop through their entire early part of their lives until they become, you know, until they finally realize that it's just called work. Mm-hmm. Um, now the second side of that is I do believe that one of my pursuits in life is to blur the line between work and play. And I am a believer that you should follow your passions. Um, I've, I did that all through my youth and I, um, I coached skiing and I coached sailing and I coached baseball uh, cause that's what I love to do. I, I then worked construction cause I loved outside and all that stuff. After school, I, I let go of that and I went into finance and I worked in the business world and corporate world. Um, and it just, it, that was an awesome experience because it reaffirmed this belief that we should be following what we love. And that's when I, um, I quit the job and, and started just as this person did in the fitness world. Um, but I gave it a try. I, mm-hmm. I mean, I did it for over two years. So it wasn't like four months in. Um, and then I'm like saying like, this isn't for me. I would, um, I think that you need to go into it long enough. So my take on this, uh, this person would be to, if I'm assuming they're straight out of school and this is their first job. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to take, make an assumption. I would, I would say that you cannot leave a job, um, for, you know, I, I hate putting this, this enough time that you feel like you really, truly gave it an honest shot and you learned a lot from it. Yeah. From there, the question becomes, how do I transition to this? Um, you rip the bandaid off. Mm. And this might be the reason to stay a little bit longer. You rip the bandaid off. You don't do it part time because then what you're doing is you're going halfway into two things. And that's a half-assed hole. It's hard enough to do one thing really well. You can't do two things even somewhat well. My, my take instead would, um, you have an opportunity now to be, have a paycheck and to have a career and have some stability is um, you stay with the police force, you create that stability while you work on building your business externally, but you don't pull the actual trigger until um, you have enough ducks in the line. Mm-hmm. So what I'm saying is like start personal training people on the weekends at nights or in the mornings. Once you have a clientele of 30 to 50 people that would follow you to a gym, that's when you open up. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, in in that, let's just assume that he, he that this individual listens. I think it's a he, but um, that he listens. He says, "Okay, I'm going to commit two years to this, even even if I know today that uh, this isn't what I thought it was." Whatever. I imagine, and maybe it's the question, but I imagine that if he spends the next two years thinking, "God, this is the worst thing. I just need to get through this two years, and then I'm going to get out of here," that that the, that's going to be a hard two years, as opposed to what. Um, looking at it as whether it's a learning experience or whether it was something else. So I guess maybe that's the question is like, how does he spend the next two years assuming that he's listening and says, okay, I hear that. You're right. How does, how does he spend the next two years not just looking at an arbitrary date on the calendar and just literally just counting down the days, you know, coming home miserable every night? Yeah. Yeah, um, exactly what you just said. You're going to use this as the learning experience. There are no failures. There are no mistakes in your life. They are just different avenues for you to learn. So this is going to be the best opportunity because talk about an opportunity to learn people skills. Talk about an opportunity to learn some administrative skills, to learn some um, detailed paperwork skills, whatever it might be. This is going to serve you at some point later in your life. Not immediately when you open your gym, possibly, maybe not. That doesn't matter. What you want to do is go into each of these things, always, always, always doing everything, what you can for what you got, uh, do everything you can with what you got for where you are. Because what could happen here is someone sees you busting their ass, working so hard in this moment, and that could create some opportunities down the line where you go, um, hey, I'm leaving. And a guy goes, you know, maybe it was like somebody on the fringe goes, dude, whatever you're doing, I just know how hard you work, how passionate you are, how good a person you are. I want to back your next endeavor. Mm-hmm. Whatever, just always, you know, there's the saying of, ah, oh, man, I'm going to, I wish it would be such a better story if I knew who it actually was. There is, um, um, Ryan Holiday talks about in the obstacles of the way where a, um, a guy starts off working as a janitor for a university 
cleaning the toilets. Mm -hmm. And because he works is so hard in that moment, nobody enjoys that job. Talk about like, this isn't what I thought it was. Like, oh, what was me? Like, it's not fulfilling. Like I, you're cleaning toilets. He worked so hard in every position he was given. He ended up becoming the president of the university mm. because people, it's hard to keep excellence quiet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Next question. What are your policies for employees at CrossFit New England's or Community Fitness New England's <laughs> personal social media? Cross, CrossFit New England. As of right now, it's CrossFit New England. Oh, badass. Um, personal social media accounts. Are they allowed to post about them partying and doing things that are not uh, in line with a healthy lifestyle? Is that frowned upon? Or, uh, and um, do you see it bringing negative consequences in regards to their job? Okay, so uh, I'm going to answer this very literally. In terms of actual policies, we do not. Got it. But in terms of um, uh, we do talk about it. So it's not a written down policy, but is that what I mean by that? Yep. Um, it probably should, though. Um, but in terms of they are representative of our business and in today's environment, in the connection age, um, there is no separation between who you are at work and who you are in person, particularly in our field where it's a relationship based thing. Now, if you were a, um, a service technician for, um, um, an air conditioning company, like that wouldn't be as big of a deal, right? Mm -hmm. Even though you are in face-to-face -face contact with these customers, you're not building meaningful relationships with them. They're not digging into your personal lives. In our case, all of our coaches are the role models, the heroes, and the people that others are emulating and trying to strive to be like. Because of that, they need to represent that ideal. Now, I'm not saying they have to be perfect, but what I do have to, what I am asking them to do is to be responsible. And one of the principles that we rely on is being overly responsive and responsible. Now, being in certain positions carries with it certain sets of responsibilities. One of the responsibilities you have as a coach at CrossFit New England is the perception you're giving off of what you find valuable, meaningful, and the way you live your life. Now, there's no better way for you to exemplify that than through social media. Mm -hmm. So for that reason, we need you to be careful of what you are posting. Just like if you were um, on the New England Patriots, or just like if you were, had political office, or if you had, you now represent something bigger than yourself, because of that, you can't just free will nilly and kind of do this however you want to. My daughter's on a, a division one sports team. Um, they're not even allowed to have public accounts at all, period, mm. because of this. So yeah, it's, it, it does matter. Um, absolutely. Got it. Last question we've got for you today. I informed my members, this is a gym owner, I informed my members that I should have taken an extra day before making a final decision about de-affiliation. I, uh, I now want to give CrossFit HQ a chance to take a different course under new leadership. When I made my initial decision, there was lots of emotions going on, potential staff and member pressure and a lot of social media pressure. How do you advise gyms communicate this kind of reconsideration? So obviously this individual already made this decision, kind of already figured out how to communicate it. But he was more bringing up the idea of like, I think that more people would, could, could hear or want to hear from you about how, how to, how to talk about this, how to communicate this, uh, given yeah. th that it has been a big deal, certainly. Yeah. So, um, this affiliate owner is finding themselves in a, um, a tough spot yep. because they didn't rely on one of our principles, which is, um, don't react respond. Mm -hmm. So they said it, they were like, lots of pressure, lots of emotion, crisis of the moment, we're de-affiliating. And they kind of shouted that from the rooftops. Um, that is a reaction to what's going on. If this person had instead thought about how to respond most appropriately, um, or more appropriately, I should say, um, which is, I'm not saying we did this perfectly, but what we did is when we said we were de-affiliating, we said we will. We are planning to disaffiliate. Not that we are, mm -hmm. um, barring some changes at CrossFit HQ. So it, uh, it, that's that's a little more tactful. It's a little more thought out. It's not reactionary. It's not just kind of like jumping on the bandwagon. Um, and because of that, it's very easy. When we told our members what we were doing, they were like, "Actually, we didn't have to tell them." They asked. They were like, "Was this the change you were looking for?" Yep. And it was really simple. I said, yes, this is the change we're looking for. If this deal goes through and Eric Rosa is the new owner and CEO, we are going to remain CrossFit New England. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of in hindsight. Yep. 
Yep. The fact that this this owner did not do that doesn't mean it's not the end of the world. What an it's a great opportunity for them to be human. And people are going to respect um, business owners that are human because people relate to humans. They don't relate to organizations. If you put out some sort of formal press release or something like of the likes of you know um, um, apologies to the for the inconsistencies in our messaging, yep. we now recognize that in the um, with further information that the um, changes at the top of you know you don't have to talk like that. You just talk like a human being, like you are. And be like, um, and you just have a, whether it's a message or video or in person, you just let them know exactly what you just told me through this question. Mm -hmm. We, we overreacted. Uh, We want to stay a part of CrossFit. This, this, all you have to, I mean, it's a really easy question. We overreacted. We want to stay a part of CrossFit. We love this thing. We always have. We just couldn't represent what CrossFit was representing in that moment. Mm -hmm. Things have changed. We're so excited about the future to come. Because of that, um, as long as this deal goes through, again, more and more calculated, as lo- so you don't have to retract yourself again. Yeah. As long as this deal does go through, we are very excited for the potential future of remaining a CrossFit affiliate. Yep. Yep. It goes back to another principle we've talked about, which is always be communicating, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Awesome. As Oops. a human being. Yes. Yes. As a human being. Yes. Um, that is all the questions I've got for you today, Ben. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to everybody who reaches out, asks questions, keep on sending them. We'll keep answering them until next week. We'll see you, uh, (laughs) until next week. Stay strong. You can get every episode of Chasing Excellence wherever you listen to your podcasts or on YouTube. Until next time. Thank you for listening.